Welcome to the new School of Marketing podcast, the place for smart, simple strategies that will amplify your business results. Sharing practical tips, insider knowledge and actionable advice because marketing is something that every business owner can do. Now, let's get started. Introducing your host, Bianca McKenzie, mum, lover of snow sports, camping, horse riding and in-demand launch strategist and Facebook advertising knowledge bank. Welcome to the new School of Marketing podcast. I am Bianca McKenzie, and today we're talking about avoiding costly DIY website mistakes with Mel Driver. Lovingly nicknamed the queen of e-com by her clients, Mel is a Shopify expert and the founder of a 43-time award-winning skincare brand. With over a decade of e-commerce experience, she helps business owners avoid costly mistakes when building their websites. Mel specializes in creating high converting Shopify stores that stand out in the crowded e-commerce landscape. Welcome to the show, Mel. Super excited to have you here. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. You're most welcome. That is a bit of a mouthful, 43-time award-winning skincare brand. That is incredible. Um, yeah, maybe we'll do a little bit of an intro. Tell me about your skincare brand, but also about the other side of your business. Yeah, so um, so I've been in business for over, over 11 years now uh, with my skincare range and Back in the days when natural skincare wasn't as mainstream as it is today, I had a very nasty allergic reaction to, you know, personal care products and skincare products. And for someone who's got no known allergies whatsoever, I was extremely shocked to see my face swell up beyond recognition and I couldn't see properly for days. Um, which that which led me to do some research and look closer at ingredients that are used in skincare products. And I am still in disbelief today, like more than 12 years later, that also ingredients are used in skincare products go also into garage decreaser and brake fluid. And when I discovered that, I was thinking, well, why would anyone want to knowingly or even unknowingly put this onto their skin? Uh, and then I um, I learned how to formulate the products myself. So I got myself a diploma in organic skincare science. I started to formulate my own products. And um, it's basically a skincare range for busy women who don't have the time or patience for lengthy or complicated skincare routines. Like my um, bestseller, my signature products, a five-minute um, routine. So basically it's three steps in five minutes and you're out the door ready for the day. And yeah, so basically 11 years later, uh, it's plumed into a 43-time award-winning skincare brand. That's amazing. That is incredible. And then you've got, you know, your e-com Shopify website store, and that's what we're going to mostly talk about today. So, um, yeah, let's talk about that. Sure. Cool. Well, because of the intro, I want to know what are the most common mistakes business owners make when they are DIYing their Shopify store? Because we all kind of know that Shopify is a platform where you can DIY, but that doesn't mean that it's all going to be easy. So yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, so just first of all, the tips and the mistakes I'm sharing today is basically across any website platform. It doesn't specifically have to do something with e-commerce. Uh, it's literally for anyone DIYing their website, whether they're using WordPress, Wix, Squarespace, and hopefully none of the other ones that are less known but still out there. Uh, so basically the number one mistake I see is that overloading the homepage. Um, it's, yeah, so a lot of business owners think when they are DIYing a website, they think that they have to overload the homepage with way too much information. So whether it's showing every single product they have available in store, using too many colors, sometimes not even enough colors to highlight specific elements uh, or just adding excessive design elements like a cluttered homepage can overwhelm visitors and make it difficult for them to focus on what's important like your products and your calls to action. So the tip here is to keep it simple, clean and focused. Only highlight your key products like bestsellers or latest arrivals on your homepage and then also just a select number of collections. I also see a lot of business owners feel like they have to literally plaster the homepage full of all the products or full of collections. 
Uh, so you literally don't have to show everything. Just um, select three products and three collections um, and then let them click through your website um, for more. Um, yeah, so that's basically tip number one and mistake number one. Okay. <laughs> I like that and I can totally uh, relate to that because, yeah, an overwhelmed mind says no. So if you yeah, open a website and it's just too much, you're like, ah, no, <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> um, and given that you've been in the e-commerce space for so long, um, I'm pretty sure that, and you've, I know you've worked on a lot of different websites. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how poor website, poor website design can impo- impact your bottom line? I know that like, you know, having that cluttered space is one of them, but yeah, what other factors and like how can it really impact your, your income in a way? Yeah, so basically it all has to do with all of the mistakes. So I'm trying to answer your question without naming all the other mistakes I've got uh, <laughs> lined up. But basically, um, if a visitor is overwhelmed with too many choices at one go, they just leave their website and they never come back. Uh, if a website is uh, it looks like, and I'm always trying to be nice here, but I see so many DIY websites and they just look like a dog's breakfast um so the quality if the quality is not there is if it really looks like a diy uh, a lot of people there's it would then reflect onto the product and people then think uh if the website doesn't look very nice and homemade uh, then they do question the product quality and then they leave if a website loads very too slow uh, you know, people don't have much attention span. It needs to be fast. Otherwise, they leave. And the bottom line here is you'll lose out on the customer or client, depending yeah. on obviously what business you're in. Yes, I uh, definitely <laughs> can relate to that too. If it doesn't load fast enough, I'm out of here. Thank you very much. Got mm-hmm. other things to do. Um, let's just dive into all the mistakes, to be honest. Like, let's just put it out there and we can just talk about all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So mistake number two is ignoring the user experience. So user experience is absolutely critical. Like a website that's too hard to navigate or too slow to load can quickly turn potential customers away. People won't just stick around if your site is frustrating to use. Focus on creating a clean, intuitive design and ensure your website loads quickly to keep visitors engaged. The tip here is to focus on clean, intuitive designs and fast loading times to improve the user um, user experience and keep your visitors engaged. And as also the other thing is to um, don't have an overly confusing menu, so make sure that's structured really well. So you have your you know categories, collections, and things like that, and you just don't also don't have it all on a home page on the main menu so you can use drop downs um, to simplify it a little bit because again too much choice gets too overwhelming and then people do leave Um, and then the other thing is you can also use um, uh, online tools for image compression because if the images are too um, big like oh my god you wouldn't believe what I've actually just saw last week I've had customers or clients I should say uh, upload product photos to the website. They're like 30 megabytes or something. And I nearly had a heart attack just looking at the numbers and I'm like, oh my goodness. So please do yourself a favor, use something like tiny PNG or tiny JPEG or any other online uh, compression tools to reduce the image file size before you upload them to avoid long load times and remember a quiet user experience is key to converting your visitors into customers um, and then the next web uh, the next website mistake i see is a lack of opt- uh, mobile optimization because um in this day and age more than 80 percent of website visitors are actually using their mobile phones and only 20 percent using their desktop uh, so we should really focus on designing the website for mobile optimization first and then desktop second 
Um, so if your Shopify isn't or any website really isn't optimized for mobile, you're potentially losing a huge portion of your audience. And many DIY websites are not mobile friendly, which again leads to poor user experience on smartphones and tables. So make sure your store is fully responsive and looks great on any device. This really is the key to keeping your mobile visitors engaged and driving more sales. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because Shopify, in a way, I see as a platform that has the, like, it, it is built for both mobile and so <laughs> it's like if you are not optimizing it you're kind of not using it to its full potential because the options are all there and I also find it interesting that people are not thinking mobile first and I, I understand why because we mostly create the websites on our computers I mean I cannot do any website stuff on my phone I can browse them but I can't create anything on my phone so I can see why but yeah, definitely uh, if you're not creating for mobile first, some businesses even have a, like a completely different look for mobile versus um, desktop because, yeah, with menu items and things like that, there is, I guess there is that option. So it's fascinating that businesses still do not have that, yeah, that mobile optimization happening, which is, I just, yeah, <laughs> baffles me a lot yeah and it's actually so for example shopify makes it quite easy and i'm pretty sure wix for example and squarespace do too so they've got the option at the top that when you are designing in desktop mode you can very easily toggle over to mobile and see how it looks and then um, you'll be most of the time you'll be shocked after you created the most beautiful page for desktop once you click over to look how it looks on, on mobile you'll be absolutely shocked that you almost have to do more than 50 percent of the work because it just doesn't look good it's just not optimized for mobile yeah <laughs> fascinating isn't it i mean yeah mm. Um, and yeah, a lot of people do definitely uh, forget it, forget about that. And then, because this is, I find a tricky part of website design and I can imagine I'm not a, web, a website designer, but I have created quite a few websites. I find the tricky part, the whole user experience on desktop versus the user experience on mobile, you're almost creating two separate websites because the experience is quite different. Um, mm, how, how can a DIY really think about this user experience? Because I feel like when, when it's your own business, you're so close to it, you're often overcomplicating things or forgetting things because you're so close to it. So looking at it from you know, someone who's, yeah, at the other end, the user, how can they really help people navigate their website and have it make it a better experience? Like I can, one example I can think of is um, have all the information but limit the amount of clicks because nobody wants to click and click and click and click. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what other things they, can they think about? Yeah, so, for example, um, a lot of us tend to forget that images look um it depends on the image. So you might have a, a banner image where you have your products all aligned next to each other. Um, and that looks beautiful on desktop. But then when you look on um, mobile, like the image is too big and too long and it might be too much text. So you would then have to have a look uh, and finding a different image that you can use that is better suited for a mobile view. Uh, you might also, if if your theme, whichever you're using, um, has the option to change the text, uh, to reduce the text, or if um, if if your theme again, it does unfortunately uh, heavily depend on what theme you're using. But then sometimes there's the option where you can have the text on on desktop. You would have the text on top of the image, but then on mobile you would select to have the text that's usually on the main banner. You would select to have the the copy underneath the image. So that's just one thing. Just always keep in mind. Um, yeah, like literally, basically use your computer to design the website, but literally almost start with mobile and then move on to desktop 
because, yeah, as you said before, we must have to create two sides sometimes. And unfortunately, even though a lot of the themes available there do say multi, or, sorry, mobile optimize, um, there's still like certain elements like multi columns, for example, that just don't have enough options within that element uh, to make it look good on mobile. So, for example, if you wanted to display so HSO is a is an example. Five trust batches, like say for example, plant based, gluten free, handmade, uh, sugar free, and I don't know, um, uh, vegan, for example. So you've got them nicely lined up on desktop, but then the multi column doesn't really align them nicely on mobile. So you've got um, you can either have five showing at once so you've got three or two or three at the top and then you've got two underneath but then there's no option to center the bottom two and so yeah so you actually almost have to get a little bit tricky to work with that to make it look good on both yeah it is really hard isn't it and I think at some point you got to kind of just make a decision <laughs> on it look at your data I guess and see where most of your visitors are coming from and which experience is better and and kind of just go well I'm only getting 20 percent of traffic from desktop so maybe I should just make the mobile look the priority and you know it's not gonna be perfect on desktop kind of thing yeah. um until <laughs> there's a better solution for it maybe I don't know <laughs> Yeah. Um, you already also mentioned, um, like if things look a bit DIY and like not really good and clear and, um, and I think you're referring to photography in that sense as well. And this is another part, isn't it? I mean, you can have the most amazing looking theme and website, but if your photos are not good, it, I guess, drags the whole experience down. Um, can you talk a little bit about photography and how it affects sales and, and like what would you recommend people do yeah so it's a, photography is actually on my list of mistakes as well so many business owners think think that they can take their own product photos with an iphone or digital camera but poor product photography can seriously undermine the perceived quality of your products uh, so just as a as a little bit of a story, my husband actually studied photography, not so much product photography. However, he did study photography and I may say he's a pretty good photographer. He tried to take my product photo uh, my product photos back in the days when I first started because I am, I was, as many of us, trying to DIY everything to keep the costs down and starting business. And so he's uh, taken the product photos and it just makes a huge, like, I mean, I can't say that it was very, I mean, he took quite nice pictures, but still uh, today I would not ever upload them to a website. And so that's just as an example, even though you might think you can take photos, um, product photography is so much trickier, but because, not just the trickiness um, of taking the right picture, shadows lights you know for example my products they have a metallic logo so that makes it extra hard to take photos uh black packaging again is very hard to take photos of um but not just that there is so many elements that go into photography like you basically when you're first starting ideally you should be working with a brain strategist to bring the whole strategy together before you actually look at anything um I've worked with someone and I'm pretty sure you'll be able to see in my product photography if you visit my website that everything is lined up. Like literally everything has been discussed for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's a proper strategy in place. So it's not like I'm feeling like I could take a few photos today and see what props I can find in the kitchen or in the garden and align this all up and it just doesn't work. So good product photography is essential for attracting and converting customers. So if you're not confident in your photography skills, consider investing in professional product photo photos or learning the absolute basics, which is literally non-negotiable because quality images build trust and enhance the perceived value of your products, which leads to more sales. And I actually have another story um, on this topic as well. I've recently worked with um, 
a client, she started to DIY her website, but she got stuck because it was just over her head and also in my time. And I seem to come in a lot when people starting their DIY projects and then they feeling like they haven't done a good job and then fixing up the DIY mistakes is kind of my jam. But she also wanted to get her partner to do the product photography. And I am, and, and I think, like, no, no, I don't think I know that she is so grateful that I talked her out of it because I recommended her to my product photographer and she is over the moon. Like, what it made a difference on her website to using product photography done by a professional. It, like you wouldn't believe what a difference it might and it's the launch day for her tonight so she's launching tonight and i'm so excited because she's got the most beautiful product photos and a very brand new website and it just makes such a such a difference but then also the other um, mistake i really wanted to touch on is um a poor a poor product description so mm. it's um a lot of the product descriptions that I see are very vague, uninspiring or overly generic descriptions that fail to communicate the unique value of the products. So this can lead to customers feeling unconvinced and ultimately leaving without making a purchase. And to avoid this, use clear, engaging language that speaks directly to your audience. Focus on the benefits of your products. Answer questions that the customer may have. And include sensory words to help your customers imagine using your products. So consider using a formula, feature plus benefit plus emotional hook. Try to tell a story, paint a picture that captures not just attention, but also targets your ideal customer's emotion. Yes, I would totally 100% agree with that. Like photography and the words kind of in a way go together match made in heaven like you can have the most amazing photos but if you barely describe the product or who it's for or what it can do for them then I'm just looking at like you know like if it's skincare I'm just looking at a picture of a bottle <laughs> anyway, it like it doesn't speak to me because it's just I guess a picture but mm. without with just the words and not very good photography well probably wouldn't even read the words because I'd look at the photo going, yeah, I don't know if I can trust that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, the two, they do go hand in hand and it is all about speaking, and I talk about this all the time, speaking to your ideal client, like who is it for and how, and but not just, not only just listing the benefits or what's in the product, it's like who is it for and how, what do they want to get out of it? That's always my question. Like, what does your client want to get out of it? Because they're they're in they're not interested in what is in the thing. They're interested in what it can do for them. So yeah, having it's amazing, isn't it? Like you start a business and you're really good at creating X, Y, or Z, and then you have to wear all the hats. You have to do the website. You have to write the copy. There's the images. There's everything. And as much as DIYing can get you to a certain point. And I definitely will say DIY if that's the only way you can start your business because there's so many people that let themselves be held back because there's so many other obstacles. But if you can at all invest, I, yeah, I'm like totally on your side, like with the photography and, and all of that. The other thing, and I don't know if you see this, is when you do photography, don't just photograph the product. This is this, this is my personal opinion but also like my marketing opinion don't only photograph the product photograph how it's used like it's almost like like I work with a number of clients and it's like great you've got this photo of the product and this in this case it's a food product and I'm like but how do I know what's in it like in terms of how big is it <laughs> um, how like how big is the product that's in it um, how many come in a bag what does it look like? And so like, it's like, don't just give me the the packaging. And this is definitely the food kind of product that I'm thinking about, but like show me the product in like outside of its back and in its use and like, you know, how many are in the bag? Well, <laughs> um, so yeah, it's like there's product photography and then there's, I guess the whole lifestyle 
photography with it. It's the same when I buy clothes. I don't want to just see it from the front and from the back. I want to see multiple different models wear it. And I and I, you know, it adds to cost and things like that. But I'm not a size eight. <laughs> can you put it on some other people so I can see what I'm purchasing? So I guess that's, you know, more of, I guess, the product photography. Um, and then, yeah, I agree with, with with the words that you write and it has a secondary benefit and I really want to ask you about it as well because I I know and you know that SEO is really important and um, search engine optimization. Can you talk a little bit more about that because I – don't think a lot of my audience would know what it is and what it does for your website. Why is it important? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's actually one on uh, one of the mistakes on my list is ne neglecting the SEO basics. So basically, SEO is crucial for making your website visible to potential customers, but it's even overlooked. So basically, what it does for you in very short, it's basically using the right keywords on the right pages so that once and hopefully you have submitted your sitemap to your Google Search Console, that people are able to find you using those keywords. So say, say for example, you are a candle maker uh, and you're selling coconut, coconut wax candles. Uh, so you would definitely then wanting to use keywords. Obviously, you need to do some proper keyword research. This is just at the top of my head, but you want to, for example, use some keywords that include coconut, uh, coconut wax candles. Uh, if you make them yourself, you want to probably include hand poured candles. If you're selling at markets locally, you probably want to do a little bit of local SEO and scatter a few locations within your area um, onto your website and again there needs to be a proper strategy so don't just go wildly and plaster your website full of different keywords uh, so you have one main keyword per page uh, and then per page you have then that one keyword and you have multiple keyword variations so as an example you've got say for example coconut wax candles is one keyword and then you could then have hand poured candle uh hand poured candles or hand poured coconut wax candles or something like this just as an example and again without using targeted keywords in your meta descriptions product descriptions titles and optimized content your site might not appear in search results and you miss out on valuable organic traffic so make sure you do proper keyword research and there's some fantastic tools available uh, the majority is not free. So you've got Uber Suggest, which is from Neil Patel. That's on a more affordable side of things. Um, and then you have SEMrush and IHrefs, and they are in the hundreds of dollars on a monthly basis. Um, and uh, but you also need to then ensure you have all your images uh, optimized um, and actually naming your images correctly doesn't just help you uh, doesn't just help google it also helps you because if you say for example you're running your business and you're operating for two or three years down the track and you continue uploading images and images and you never name them properly like you would never find an image that has X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four, something like this in the name. But if you were to name your image properly and say um, green class candle or something like that, then at least, you know, you can look for the word green in your files on your website and can find that again. And that also that avoids uploading the same images over and over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, there's a whole lot more to this, isn't there? Like SEO is so important, but it's like oh, some of it even go it goes over my head, and I've been doing this for more than ten years as well. So, as yeah, it, I'm getting to that point where it's like, oh, definitely uh, DIYing is great, but um, there's so much more that is involved with creating a website. There's just so much involved with it. Um, absolutely, it's not just about being able to add elements to the website. It's a whole, like it's a proper strategy usually in place for the flow of the homepage and the pages because ideally you want people to, you know, when they end up on your homepage, you want to basically be able to funnel them through so they end up on your product pages, about us page, and then ultimately check out and on a thank you page. 
and it's literally so many elements and I see a lot of people they're just uh, finding tutorials on YouTube and on just one specific section and element for one page but it's just so much more to that the whole user experience and it's something um, you know just because we know how to move elements on a website and we can upload some pictures does not unfortunately mean that we are a website designer I always like to try to put it nicely like if you are making candles, then I wouldn't go ahead and try and attempt making candles. Um, you know, so we all have our own specialities and a lot of things can go wrong when it comes to website design. And I look at it from a different perspective as well, because yes, you are saving money DIYing your website, but ultimately what are you losing on sales if your website is not up to scratch? So Yes, it might be a little investment at the start to get someone to do your website properly or to hire or end to hire a product photographer to get it all nice um, and beautiful. Um, but then it's it's done for a while and um, then you can focus on all the other things because I also find that a lot of people who are DIYing the website, whilst the website is never finished, it's never like a project you set and forget, it's always work to be done. But I find they, they're spending a lot more time overcorrecting. And also another mistake, actually, which is not on my list, they post in various Facebook groups. I've just uh, launched my business. I designed my website myself and I'm not getting any sales. And mind you, it might have been only last week. Um, could I please get some feedback? And the mistake with things like that is a lot of people have input. So you might end up with a list of a hundred different things that you might want to optimize on your website based on the feedback people who actually got no idea about websites have provided. And you're basically going down another rabbit hole. So you think you're doing yourself a favor asking for feedback, but you're not when you're asking the wrong people. Yes. If they're not your ideal client, then it doesn't really matter. So yeah, SEO and strategy and like, there's just so many pieces to setting up a business and yeah, DIYing is great, but I don't know. And this is probably from me being in business for so long as well. You can try things, you can YouTube things, you can Facebook group things, you can ask for feedback. Like you said, if it's not from the right people, it's not necessarily the right feedback. <laughs> so what can people do to, I guess, one, stay on track because that's the other thing. If you go to 50 different YouTube sites and you get, you know, uh, feedback from all these different places, it's going to look like when you're building a house and you put an extension on on that side and then you put something on the roof on that side. Like, in the end, it looks terrible because you just put all these random bits and pieces on. And a website is the same. And I know that when you start in business, there's just so much advice that comes at you. So what can people do to stay on track, but also to really get something that they're proud of and that they're happy to market and that looks so professional and amazing, even if they haven't spent like $50,000 <laughs> to start it all off? What can people do? Yeah, uh, well, there's a few things. So if you do want to stay on the DIY path, um, less is more and keep it simple is probably something that I would um, go with. Just really think about your product photography and your website in general. Um, asking friends and family for feedback is always a bad idea as well because most of the time they tell you they love it anyway. And um, again, but there's also the thing with asking for feedback in a, in various Facebook groups. So um, it, it, it can be quite tricky to DIY and then get something that looks absolutely beautiful and professionally done and things like that. Um, in my opinion, I do not exactly recommend DIYing a complete website. I, uh, when I, and, and just as an example, when I work on websites for my clients and after I deliver a website, I always have a walkthrough for an hour on Zoom because I always show them how they can do things themselves because, you know, sometimes you might want to 
update a product on the homepage or you have a special and then you want to know how to how to do things yourself. And I, I'd hate for them to having to go and pay someone to just change like a tiny little something on the website. So I always, uh, always do that. It's very important to me that my custom, my clients actually know how they can do things themselves. Um, they could uh, look at courses that are available. They're basically um, like my Shopify Blueprint course, for example. It's basically a course it's uh, easy to follow. It walks you through step by step how to start creating a Shopify account, uh, all the way up to um, uh, connecting your domain to your store when everything is ready. Um, or alternatively, you can just hire someone. Um, which again, I know it is probably for those who are on a very strict budget, um, a little bit out of the question. But again, I do want to stretch that. Uh, I'll stress that if you are DIYing your website and it is not up to scratch, you have the potential of losing a lot of sales, um, which again costs you money in the long term. And so you'll just have to really make that decision. Do I DIY or do I just pay someone and get it done properly from the start? Yeah, I like that. It's like go all in. <laughs> or is it go hard or go home kind of thing? But I do like that you are actually giving people an option so that if you cannot invest fully in a done for you website, at least look at a done with you option or yeah, like a course that you can follow and I, I'll pop the link for your um, Shopify Blueprint course in the show notes as well because, yeah, if you cannot fully invest in it, then at least get some support and get support from one person, <laughs> not, you know, YouTube five different people and still have it look like a dog's breakfast and not all nicely put together. And I like that your course also has you know connecting your domain because a lot of people don't actually know it's not like you you sign up for Shopify and you get the domain name and you need to link it and then potentially setting up an email address with that same domain there are so many steps that are part of this journey of setting up a business and getting it ready getting your stuff ready to sell and I uh, if you are not getting sales in your online store, I would say, and this is like completely off topic, <laughs> but I just thought about it, take your products to a market first where your ideal clients, your potential clients come and get that real-time feedback on your packaging, on the product. If your stuff is already selling and it's selling at markets, then it can potentially sell online with the right setup, with the right website, the right descriptions, the right product photography. It's kind of like a market, but you don't have that face-to-face -face where you can tell people about the product. So find out what questions they're asking. And I kind of like that exercise. It's like, well, to figure out if your stuff sell, take it to a few markets first and pay attention to how people interact with your product, what questions they ask. It's so much good information to then write your product descriptions. Um, and, yeah, and then I guess you can take the next few steps. Um, do you have anything to add to that? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no, I think we definitely covered all the mistakes I've had on my list. Um, the only thing I can also say, or if, if that's okay to say, um, so the uh, waitlist is now open for my Shopify Blueprint and it's oh, a awesome. very boutique a uh, very boutique course. Uh, so it's only limited to 10 spaces because it's very hands-on. Um, and it will be, I can't remember if it's an eight weeks or 10 weeks course, but we're literally doing everything. So you get the training videos every um, every week is a new uh, release of a new module, but then we also have a private Facebook group um, where everyone will have access to me and we're doing weekly live Zoom calls um everyone can jump on and ask questions or can show them but we'll also be having other experts uh that will give some tips on product photography seo how to price your products for profit um and a few other things so um and the course is designed to help anyone just starting out uh to set them up right uh so they basically have everything to to become a successful business owner 
I love that. Perfect. So yeah, if you can't invest in someone doing it all for you, like I said before, do it with someone because I know how many businesses probably sit there waiting to be launched and people just don't do it because it's just too much, too much um, standing in their way. And there's a lot of amazing businesses. Oh, you and I are both in Tasmania. There's a lot of amazing businesses in Tasmania that I see at markets, but they do have not. They don't have a web presence. They have no website, and I don't know if that is because of potentially it's too expensive or it's too hard. So if you are in that position, um, then definitely look at like a done with you option, like the one Mel has, because yeah. There's so much potential online and there's potential for more sales and, you know, you started from scratch and then you're 43 award winning um, business. So that is incredible. Um, I love that. Thank you. Um, I always have two other questions that I ask my podcast guests and they can be completely like not business related. Um, well, one of them is, what are you curious about right now? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I don't know, actually. I think I'm curious, always curious, because I'm such a busy, busy woman, and I'm always curious about how I can be healthier, live a healthier lifestyle that still fits into my crazy work diet, because obviously I'm running two businesses, so it's, it's as if one wasn't busy enough, right? Um, so I'm definitely always curious on how I can improve my health and the health of my family um, and still be there as well as a not really mom, but fur mom and, and wife and, and um, live healthy. Yeah, that is, that is one that I'm forever <laughs> questioning too, because it's like sometimes you don't feel like cooking. Like how can I still have those healthy options while also running around like, yeah, crazy? <laughs> um, and if you had $5,000 in your marketing budget, what would you spend it on? Right now, I would ins- would definitely spend it on advertising. Everyone's, well, not everyone, but a lot of people say that. Like I feel like I need to remove this question because it's, <laughs> it's not necessary to say it because like, I do ads, but. Um, I thought maybe Actually, you were going to. I was. I thought I maybe you were going to say one. photography. <laughs> Yeah, no, I definitely am covered with my product photography. I actually have a really good product photographer on hand and she's actually so reasonable, you wouldn't believe it. No, but the other thing would be um, I am updating some of my stocks. So I have a couple of products that have been out of stock for a little while um, and they are just so expensive. Uh, so that definitely would be something to, I'm so desperate to add them back into the range because I get requests all the time and, yeah, that would be another really good investment, 5000 for that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, that is the end of this week's show. If you have questions about avoiding costly website mistakes, head to meldriver.co. I'll pop all of the links in the show notes for um, the Blueprint course, but all of Mel's links as well. A really big thanks to you, Mel, for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you for listening. If you like the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you heard the podcast. Your review will help others find the show and learn more about the amazing world of online marketing. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode at newschoolofmarketing.com where you can learn more about mail, check out useful links, download free resources, and leave a comment about the show. 